it was actually it was a it was in my personal career also the the end phase now in the last two or three years where I linked these these many many neuroendocrine abnormalities that we saw um, since 20 years we or no, no even more than 30 years now we're starting these neuroendocrine alterations. Once more, the first finding in a human was the low androgen levels, and I mentioned that before, and we come back to the androgen levels now. And all the other alterations that you have seen, these oestrogens in the tissue, the degradation of cortisol, the loss of sympathetic nerve fibers, the increase of sensory nerve fibers, was not well explained. There was no unifying concept behind it. Nobody understood it really, and I think with thinking of energy regulation, you will see there is a good concept behind it. You already saw that, that the lipolysis plays a role behind this sympathetic nerve fiber repulsion. Now, let's go on. Once more, at the moment we think that these etiologic factors are important in chronic inflammatory disease, and I, I present this in a careful way because it's important. This is true for all chronic inflammatory diseases, for all. So this, this listing is an important listing to understand chronic inflammatory diseases. First thing, we think that the genes play a role. Okay, yeah, very good. And that there is a susceptibility. We know that gene polymorphisms are there and that diseases are usually polygenic, meaning many polymorphisms are there and one polymorphism has a, has a relative small influence on the disease. Um, little additional risk with one gene in, in the system. So this is me meant by polygenic. The second thing is we have a complex environmental priming. And this means that the environment play, plays a role. And there are microbes, the toxins, the drugs, then injuries, the radiation, the cultural background, and the geography. For example, our diseases, the chronic inflammatory diseases, are more often in the northern hemisphere in the northern countries, in the westernized world. In Africa, you don't see them much. Africans, rural Africans, do not have rheumatoid arthritis or Crohn's disease. So the cultural background and the geographical background is important. Another important factor, of course, is the immune response itself. It is exaggerated, it is continuous, and it is directed against self and foreign, but the self and foreign antigens are harmless. Yeah, these are your own antigens, your own body antigens, or a harmless bacterium on the surface of your intestinal tract, or on the skin, or in the nose, or in the lungs, wherever. So the response is against the harmless self or harmless foreign. Such a silly thing, huh? Why, why such a silly thing? And in addition, there's tissue destruction. And when you destroy a joint and you lose your cartilage completely, you cannot repair it uh, as if it was as if before. It's not possible. There is continuous wound response. There is no proper healing, but we have the fibrotic scarring uh, process. There is scarring. And with this wound destruction, there appear so-called neo-self-epitopes. This means there are, there are antigens appear which were not there before, antigens that are now recognized by the immune system as new autoantigens, new self-antigens, neo-self-epitopes. So this is the concept for all the chronic inflammatory diseases. And more or less, one of, one of this factor, this factor, or this, are needed to, to work together to make this or this or this or this anti, uh, chronic inflammatory disease. But there is an additional f question, and the question is the systemic response. And you already saw that I'm talking about the system. Neuroendocrine is a, is a system question, is a network question, is not a local immune system question, but is a systemic question. Does the systemic response play a role? Usually, inflammation, and this can be nicely shown with the thorn of a rose, a rose, rosa in the, in the skin, uh, makes a very confined inflammatory response. You have borders around the inflamed tissue with impenetrable vessel walls. Most often they are very dense. 
where nat natural boundaries such as organ borders or fascia, so they kept away from each other. There are de is degradation of the released molecules. So a good example of this here is TNF, tumor necrosis factor. If, re if this is released, it's degraded rapidly, and it is internalized by receptor internalization. There's, and there's reuptake of the molecules by special channels and pumps. And there's continuous binding of the molecules to cell surfaces. Some, some, some of the molecules that are needed for interaction for in the network are not released from the cell, but remain on the cell. And this is a, this is a way um, to confine the inflammation to a local situation. And that is the usual thing, because if you have an inflammation in your little toe, you don't want that your brain is involved. No, you don't want it. Or if you have a little, let's say I once had a little arthritis in my, in my, uh, in this finger, in this joint, you don't want to be tired and fatigued and want to have sickness behavior, as Marco mentioned it this morning. With you don't want to have that, and you don't have it. Beautiful. But sometimes, sometimes the inflammation gets very big. And cytokines, like for example interleukin-6, are released from the tissue into the circulation. And this happens via the vessels, and then these cytokines can activate the brain and the endocrine glands. Or the cytokines bind to the sensory nerve endings, and the, the threshold of the action potentials get high, and then there is an action potential to the central nervous system via sensory nerve fibers, and uh, the brain is activated and... Uh, and cytokines, even in the brain, cytokines are upregulated then. Okay. This happens sometimes. And then, when this happens via the sensory nerve fibers, this is this way to the brain, or via the cytokines, via the circulation, then the rest of the system starts to react. And we know very well now how this is. This is the fol in the f following way. The sympathetic nervous system gets activated, but the sympathetic nerve fibers get lost. So you have a higher activity of the sympathetic nervous system, but not in the tissue locally. You make lipolysis. lipolysis. The HPA axis is activa uh, activated. The uh, gonadal axis here with the, uh, um, the, the ovaries and the testes is downregulated. The liver is... Uh, the, in, chron in the chronic situation, uh, growth hormone is, is lo uh, low, but in the acute situation, you activate growth hormone and you provide glucose to the body. And in the chronic situation, you have high levels of insulin, here hyperinsulinemia typically, and, 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 and. Yeah. So you have a systemic response. We start to have a systemic response. And we already recognize that the systemic response plays a role because the central nervous system has an influence of on, on the arthritis. Remember the hemiparesis. So now, this is the, the example. I already mentioned this hemiparetic thing and the polymyalgia, rheumatica thing, with uh, very clear. So, and another f uh, factor is this here, that the change of the uh, circadian rhythm can also change the cytokines and can change um, the the stiffness and the pain, as already mentioned. Yeah. So there is clearly a crosstalk between the two, between the system and the local inflammation. And the, and the crosstalk has most probably influence because we see changes in, in the expression of the disease. But the question is, why does it happen? Is it an accident? Is it simply an accident? Why do we need the system? Why do we need the system? Why? An immunolo a classical immunologist would say, no, we don't need the system. Oh, no, no, today it has changed. But when we go back uh, 20 years, then he said, it's the cell and the cell, and again, it's the cell. But why why is why hap, why do the, all these changes happen there is something is it is it an accident no it's not an accident certainly it's not an accident huh? 
specific, specific modulators go into circulation. Mm -hmm. So you must have something very serious in mm -hmm. order to establish the system. Otherwise, yep. Yep. as you said, the inflammatory reaction resides in the site. Yeah. Where yeah. It's so you, you must have a strong production of things okay. in order to, okay. to trigger the system. But why? Why do you activate then this brain? You change the brain. No, you don't change the brain. You change the feedback circulation. You yeah. change the system. You change, you the, change the system. Yeah. You change the systemic response. Yes. Okay, I, I, <laughs> I come up with a, a theory. When the theory, it was a crazy theory. This, this, by the way, this figure is not from, from me. This is uh, from David Pisetsky. This was the former editor of Arthritis and Rheumatism and was, is now the editor of the Rheumatologist, another other journal. And he once published a paper of us and came up with this picture, and I liked it very much. It has something to do with energy. What we, what we, knew, what we knew is that the activation of the HPA axis with the final hormone cortisol is important to make gluconeogenesis. Okay, glucose goes up, yeah? And for lipolysis, because you also need cortisol for lipolysis. And the activation of the sympathetic nervous system makes the same, makes also gluconeogenesis, makes glucogenolysis, breaks down the glucogen stores, and makes lipolysis. So the systems that we recognize as activated in the acute inflammatory situation, those systems provide energy-rich fuels to the body. This is the meaning. So now, I, t I show you <laughs> what's behind. When we have to think about an activated immune system, and I mentioned already a little before how much an immune system needs, and I have calculated the amount of energy that is needed by the immune system Go, uh, with, this, with these calculations. The calculations are relatively clear because uh, people, the, the group of uh, Dr. Judell in the United States, they nicely demonstrated uh, the amount of energy needed for protein maintenance function. So a single leukocyte, for example, produces 2.9 times 10 to the 9 proteins per day for maintenance functions. This is work from Dr. Judell. And a typical protein that he studied needs 2,300 ATP for its generation. So one molecule needs 2,300 ATPs. A quiescent, a sleeping leukocyte needs 1.1 times 10 to the minus 11 mole ATP. You can take these factors and make this out of it. So a sleeping leukocyte, very little, 10 to the minus 11 mole ATP per day. The protein generation needs 20% of cellular energy in a sleeping leukocyte. This number 20% comes from work from Frank Butgereit, who showed that the different factors in a cell need different amounts of energy in the protein production because he can shut down the protein production with cyclohexamide, for example, and then he sees that the, uh, that the cell needs 20% less energy and other things. He, he did this with channel blockers. He, did, he looked for channels, how channels influence uh, the system. He looked for the protein. He looked for the mRNA and similar things. And he found that 20% is needed. And when you use this number and this number, they can come up that a sleeping leukocyte has 5.5 times 10 to 9, 11 mole ATP. And the hydrolyzation of one mole ATP yields 50 kilojoules. So this is the energy level, the kilojoules. With this and this, you say a sleeping leukocyte needs 2.75 times 10 to the minus 9 kilojoule per day. But with the number of the leukocytes, the circulating leukocytes, and the, the tissue leukocytes, with these two numbers, with the very high numbers of leukocytes, we come up with a number of 1,600 kilojoule per day. And when this system is a little activated with a factor of 1.3 and 1.5, which happens in inflammatory diseases, then the number goes up to approximately 2,000 kilojoules that I mentioned this morning already. But this is only mild activation. It can go up, way up if this is sepsis or this is burn, wound um, healing. It goes up. So this reflects 25 per to 30% of the basal metabolic rate in the system. The Tour de France, yes? In this graph, you imply that all the leukocytes no. are activated. No, 
We, we calculated it with that 30 to 60 percent of the quiescent leukocytes are activated after immune ships. It might be a little high. We, uh, it's very high. It can be Isn't high. Isn't it? Yeah, it's yeah, very but high. It, it's, it's also neutrophils, it's, it's monocytes, it's, it's not only the T cell. The T cell are lower. No, no, of course, uh, of course. Uh, yeah. and, but it's still, it seems but to me a little still, bit higher. You, you still have this number, and then you have, you're not so far away. And we only used here in these calculations only the 30 to 60 percent. So this is the 30 percent addition, so from here, 30, and this is uh, the 60 percent. But nevertheless, we know it from, you know, you know from sepsis that these patients need uh, much more energy, uh, and they, are they get infusions with uh, things. Okay. So... The activated immune cells take all substrates. They don't choose the substrates. They take glucose, they take glutamine, they take the ketone bodies, and they take free fatty acids. So you see here, 69% from carbohydrates and protein and 31% from the fat. That's the, these are the numbers that have been dis studied. I already have shown this slide this morning. We have the big three the immune system, the brain, and the muscle under quiescent conditions. And we have this energy allocation during the day. In the day, it's particularly brain and muscle. I mentioned this this morning with a little other slide. And the, in the night, it's the immune system and the growth. So this clearly shows you the regulation via circadian rhythms, sharing the energy in the system. Now, in a healthy body, this is the healthy body. In a healthy body, the system is usually there to store energy-rich fuels. So when we when we're sitting here and you eat a little bit too much all the time, all the time you store. You know what this means, and um, you try to prevent it. So the storage goes this way: the vagus nerve makes the propulsion, the vagus nerve is responsible for the uptake of, of uh, factors, and the vagus nerve is also responsible for the storage of glucose in the liver, for example. The liver itself provides also energy-rich fuels, free fatty acids particularly, which are stored in the fat tissue. And proteins are stored in, typically in the muscle. The muscle is a protein store, because the muscle can be degraded, so the protein is released, and the muscle can be bigger and bigger. And for the, for the growth of the muscle, you need the hormones. You need the gonadal hormones, particularly the androgens. And the bone is important because the bone is also a storage organ for calcium and phosphate. And calcium and phosphate are extremely important for the immune reaction. Without calcium and phosphate, nothing works. Phosphate is in the ATP, very clear. And calcium, everybody who works with immune cells in the culture dish and has a forget, forgot, forgotten the ca calcium, uh, nothing works. It's the same with glutamine, by the way. Many, uh, most often you need the glutamine. Glutamine is, the, is an important uh, amino acid in the system for immune cells. And uh, therefore, you need calcium, you need the proteins or the amino acids, the free fatty acids and the glucose from the liver. Here you see the numbers of the stored energy. In the liver it's only 2,500 kilojoules of glucose, not much else. In the fat it's huge, 500,000 kilojoules is in the fat. In the muscle it's 5,000 kilojoules for the glucose, which is a similar number, but the proteins are 50,000 kilojoules. I have not mentioned the number here, 10 times more so this is the situation under the with the sleeping immune system. In this, when you have the local response in the tissue, a local tissue like the thorn of the rose in the knee, as I mentioned before, systemic energy provision is not needed. You take from the local lipids, for example, you break the lipids down, or you break the the, the extracellular matrix down, and when you break the matrix, the glutamate and glycine can be used from the local breakdown. There's a little circulating glucose from the liver, but you usually use the local things. And when the inflammation happens near the bone, typically the bone is eroded, and calcium and phosphate are taken from local areas. But then there's spillover of the inflammation to the system. Interleukin-6 is my classical example, because this is a very stable uh, cytokine. Um, this cytokine can travel in the blood and activates now other systems. Or immune cells act 
are activated and travel in the body. Or the sensory nerve fibers get activated. And then you have an energy appeal reaction, meaning, hey, I need more energy-rich fuels here because the local amount is not needed anymore, is not enough anymore. And then you use systemic energy supply. You activate the HPA axis in the sympathetic nervous system. You use the glucose from the distant liver with gluconeogenesis. You use the protein from the distant muscle. Protein breakdown goes into the gluconeogenesis and use the amino acids. You use lipids from distant fat. And you use ketone bodies from distant liver. And you use calcium and phosphate from distant bone. And you induce, and this is the usual thing in most chronic inflammatory diseases, you induce a general osteoporosis. And you use the calcium and the phosphate. And now you have to think of a very important point, a very important point. You don't take it up. You have, under the acute inflammatory conditions of an infectious disease, you have starvation. You are anorectic. Mar uh, Marco already mentioned this this morning, called sickness behavior. And the sickness behavior is an anorectic condition. If you have a high inflammatory activity, and uh, in an infectious disease, you don't eat. You even do not drink. And you recall last time when you had an infectious disease for a little while, you have a very concentrated urine. The urine is highly concentrated. The, the kidneys cl close. They don't produce um, water. The water is retained in the system. And it's the same. It's the same now with, and with these energy uh, uh, things because it would be very expensive, very expensive for the system to look for food. Looking for food is nearly as expensive as taking the energy out of the food. This has been studied in wild animals, can be nicely studied, and it's clearly shown that finding food is nearly as expensive as m money from the food. So this is once more the situation. You have the storage sites and the storage hormones. Now there is a cut between these green hormones and these red systems. The red system release these energetic fuels and allocate it to the activated immune system. Sympathetic nervous system activation, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal activation, the hypothalamic pituitary th thyroid activation, and the somatic axis is activated in the acute phase of the disease, and you lose the storing hormones. You lose, for example, IGF-1, you lose testosterone, estrogen, you lose DHEA, androstenedione, you, you, lose, you lose the vagus activity, you have a stronger sympathetic activity, you lo lose the vagus activi so activity. So, now, I summarize, we recognize a systemic response in inflammation. It's clear. We recognize the crosstalk between an activated immune system and the central nervous system. And we re recognize also a delicate system to regulate the energy allocation. You can see this with the circadian rhythm. You see it very nicely how this can go. And the systemic neuroendocrine activation is an energy appeal reaction. But the question, and I alluded to it several times this morning, has it been positively selected for the chronic inflammatory disease? And I said it already this morning several times that this is not the case, and there are some reasons. First reason, a chronic inflammatory disease exerts a high negative selection pressure. A chronic inflammatory disease leads to the loss of reproducibility because the affected individuals are excluded from the competition fights for nutrients, positions in the group, sexual partners. And most importantly, the long-term high inflammatory activity stops the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. And this is nicely, very nicely shown by the Grusos group. The Grusos group injected interleukin-6 ma into males. They ha had only investigated the males. And what happens with the testosterone, with in 12 hours, the testosterone was not measurable anymore very low. It's dramatic how the testosterone needs to be stopped. The hypoandrogenemia is there. So when you don't have testosterone, you, ha you don't reproduce. And if you have the disease, you, you need this testosterone. If you have a long-term disease, you, have the you need the testosterone. 
or there is no selection pressure at all. This happens because many of the chronic inflammatory diseases that we know today, yeah, they manifest in higher ages. And due to the low life expectancy of our ancestors, they got 25 years or less, they did not suffer from the chronic inflammatory disease that we know. And if they don't suffer from it, there can be positive selection pressure. There can be negative selection pressure. There is no selection pressure at all because they didn't have, have our diseases. And as I mentioned before, in Africa, the people don't have chronic inflammatory diseases. Under natural conditions, these diseases anyhow don't start to exist. We think now that there's kind of teaching aspects in the very early phase of the Im immune responses in the childhood, in the very early childhood. Um, but so there is no selection pressure at all. And in addition, some diseases, some chronic inflammatory diseases did not exist some 100, two years, 200 years ago. So with a 200 years or 100 years, there cannot be a natural selection. Not at all. So there are several reasons that there is no selection pressure, what, what, uh, whether positive or negative or whatever. But then, Dr. Akola would say there are genes, and he's correct, there are polymorphisms that are nicely linked to these chronic inflammatory diseases. And I make some examples, but these gene polymorphisms are not specifically linked to a chronic inflammatory diseases, meaning that they have been positively selected for the chronic inflammatory disease, they have been positively selected for something else. They have been positively selected mainly for infectious diseases. This principle is called antagonistic pleiotropy and was first formulated by George Williams in the 1950s in the context of the aging, of aging research. It was a very, very, very important thinking for, for evolutionary medicine. So, for example, the HLA-DR4 is normally nicely linked to rheumatoid arthritis and other autoimmune diseases. But we also know that it has a pleiotropic meaning outside of the chronic inflammatory disease without the selection advantage. Um, with, 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 with the selection, excuse me, with the selection advantage in, in the parenthesis, the decrease of risk of the dengue hemorrhagic fever or hepatitis C is linked to the high HLA-DR4. And this is a defense mechanism against infectious diseases. This is the selection advantage. HLA-B27 is linked to ankylosing spondylitis. In Germany, we say Morbus Bechterew. That was a German. In France, they say Morbus uh, Strümpel. It was a French. Um, <laughs> so now it's called ankylosing spondylitis. This is linked to the decrease of viral infections, not only one type, many different. Even, even HIV is nicely linked to it. And it's a defense against infectious agents. PTPN22, now linked to many autoimmune diseases, is linked to a higher body mass index and higher waist to hip ratio in women. The selection advantage was the storage of the energy-rich fuels. Yeah, if you can store anyhow with the PTPN22, more, more energy reserves, energy-rich fuels, it's good for you. That was the selection pressure. CTLA4 which is linked to many autoimmune diseases, has a better defense against hepatitis B virus and Heliobacter pylori. Again, the selection for advantage is the infectious disease. The NOT2 card 15 in the Crohn's patients is linked to hypertension, and this is linked to the activation of sympathetic nervous system. This was the elect uh, selection advantage. So this antagonistic pleiotropy explained why we have the polymorphisms linked to the diseases, but the... Uh, the <coughs> The genes have not been, or the polymorphism had not been positively selected for a chronic inflammatory disease. Then you ask, for what, from where do all these in, in immune responses come? They come from transient inflammatory processes, which were probably severe, were life-threatening, but didn't kill the person. And it's a very long process, particularly with the infectious disease and the host it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a huge, long um, process of co-evolution. The host, with his immune system, when the adaptive immune system appeared, 
on the market 400 million years ago. 400 million years. There were even the, the, the dinosaurs were not there. The adaptive immune system came up. And from that time point on, uh, onwards, they had always to deal with bacteria and viruses and things like this. So it's a co-evolution. Co and it's a very, very detailed and coordinated reaction between the two. It's, it's, it's a memory between a virus and an infectious disease and the host. A long, long time memory, which is evolutionarily conserved. The same is true for the wound healing, for the foreign body reaction, and for, for example, the thorn of a rose and the bacteria and the wound response, but also for the implantation of the embryonic blastocysts in the tissue, uh, in, in the uterus. This is a very immunological process. And here are many, many similar things in this process as compared, for example, to rheumatoid arthritis. We recently summarized it. This is amazing how, how similar, how very similar the processes are in the implantation of the blastocyst and rheumatoid arthritis. You do not invent during evolution two types of interleukin-6. You have only one interleukin-6 for everything. And you have only one lif uh, leukemia inhibiting factor, which is extremely important for the implantation of the embryonic blastocysts, but you use it also in inflammation. And it's, also, it's conserved for the immune reactions during pregnancy and allergic immune reactions. So now, with this in mind, we start to think of the, cha of the systemic changes one more of the, of the um, uh, neuroendocrine system in chronic inflammatory diseases. Inflammation starts in a lymphoid organ or in, a, in, the, in the local tissue, and it activates the immune system locally. Then it gets a release of cytokines activated immune cells or sensory nerve fibers get activated. They force the energy appeal reaction. The energy appeal reaction activates the HPA axis. These hormones are necessary to break down fat tissue and to provide glucose from the liver. So you have the energy-rich fuels that are needed in the immune system. And the activation of the sympathetic nervous system does the same here, here. And in addition, the sympathetic nervous system breaks down the bone. This is new finding. And this is, this is one of the, the most loveliest things uh, in the last 10 years. It's the work of Gerard Cassanti, who has five or six cell papers in the last decade, showing that the sympathetic nervous system is responsible for the breakdown of the bone. And now we can understand why a beta blocker why beta blockers given to patients prevent bone loss and prevent or, 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 or shelter the, the, the beta blocker user from fractures. So people who use beta blockers are, sh are prevented from fractures. We understand that because the sympathetic nervous system, but also cortisol, this is an old story, when you give prednisolone in high doses, you have osteoporosis. So both of these energy appeal hormones break down the bone. This breakdown of the bone is necessary for an activated immune system because in a starvation situation, in the anorexia situation, you need the calcium and phosphate from the bone because you don't take it up. You don't drink milk when you have influenza. So, and in addition, the cortisol is an important aspect for the breakdown of the muscles. That's also known. And the cytokines the, that are released from the, tish, from the inflamed tissue break also down the muscles. The, ma the major factor is tumor necrosis factor. This tumor necrosis factor was called in the 70s cachectin. And cachexia is the word for the muscle breakdown. So the cachectin. And the cachectin, by the way, was found by Bruce Beutler, who got the Nobel Prize. You mentioned it this morning. One of the people on the slide um, was Bruce Beutler, the most left on, on the slide. And he, in the, in the laboratory of Anthony Cerami, found the tumor necrosis factor. And this was one part of his important work. And he found the cachectin as tumor necrosis factor. Now we know that uh, the cytokines break down the bone, but also cortisol breaks the bone and the loss of the androgens and the loss of the gonadal hormones break, the bo uh, break down the muscle and the bone. Okay. And we see the sympathetic nerve fibers get lost from the tissue, a phenomenon that we can explain now because it ends in the surrounding fat tissue. But all of this conserved for an acute inflammatory event being in the tissue or being a systemic response with lymphoid organs involved is 
conserved or evolutionarily positively selected for the acute event is all used in the chronic inflammatory disease. And if you use that too long, you get problems. You get these problems. And I go through the problems um, shortly. Let's start on the left side. The depression, fatigue, sickness behavior. Marco already alluded to it. If you lying in bed, you don't need your brain, you don't need the muscle. They don't need energy. You, f you bring them down to a lower level. Okay? And you use that energy for something else, for the activated immune system. You start anorexia. This anorexia program is linked. And with the anorexia, unfortunately, if you have too long, uh, and the patients with chronic inflammatory disease, they really have anorexia. That they do not take up the same amount of energy that, that the usual person take up. This has been investigated. And they don't take up, along with the energy, they don't take up vitamins. And so they start to get hypovitaminosis D. They start to become hypomagnesemic. Ma the magnesium is going down and many similar things. Insulin resistance now and the hyperinsulinemia is a very interesting thing because insulin resistance affects only the muscle, the liver, and the fat. But the immune system needs insulin. You can activate the immune system with insulin. You can activate you can proliferate. It's a proliferative factor, insulin. And insulin-like insulin -like growth factor is a similar proliferative factor. And several culture dishes don't work without insulin. Some people here work uh, probably with stem cells, and so you, you might use insulin in your system. Otherwise, it would not work. So uh, insulin is a proliferative factor and is an immunostimulatory factor. So making insulin resistance to these major organs, muscle, liver, and uh, fat, leads to a, a reallocation of the energy to the activated immune system because they are not stored in these organs, but they are released and they are given to, the, to an activated immune system. You inhibit the parasympathetic nervous system, but you activate the sympathetic nervous system, so this goes along. You have cachexia, you use the amino acids from the muscle and make gluconeogenesis and give the glutamine and alanine, these are the major factors, to the activated immune system, and you induce cachectic obesity in these patients. They have more fat than muscle. You have the mild activation of the HPA axis. This is understandable now because it activates the gluconeogenesis and lipolytic process. The cortisol to androgen preponderance, more cortisol than androgen, um, leads to gluconeogenesis, glucolysis, uh, uh, um, gluconeogenesis, glucogenolysis, and lipolysis, and the breakdown of the, of the muscle. You have the loss of sympathetic nerve fiber as an adaptive program in a wound response, ending in the tissue, in the fat tissue. You have dyslipidemia. This is an interesting thing. Dyslipidemia, this is a special um, inflammatory form of uh, lipidemia. It's the so-called activated HDL molecule, and the activated HDL molecule has in the, in, the, in the core ceruloplasmin, for example, or serum amyloid A. And these, interestingly, they are important for arthrogenesis. These, interestingly, are important to stop the reverse cholesterol transport. They, the, usually, HDA molecule, HDL molecules take up from the tissue the cholesterol, and take it into the HDL, and the HDL is going to the liver. But with the serum amyloid A and the ceruloplasmin and other factors, this doesn't happen. It's the opposite. The cholesterol is given to the tissue. And this is the reason why we see foam cells. They are called foam. Well, they're, they're looking like foam um, in uh, arteriogenesis. These are lipid stores in macrophages. This is a local store of energy-rich fuels near, near uh, the inflammatory process. Hypoandrogenemia is an adaptive program because it breaks down the muscle. Gonadal dysfunction is the same, and it stops reproduction during an acute phase. But in these patients, you have a long-term gonadal dysfunction. It's well known now. They have a lower fertility. They have a, a clearly no lower fertility. The sperm motility is less. This is all program, all program. Then there's inflammation-related anemia. And this was, a, this was um, hard to, to think of, anemia. But then I got to um, 
to sickle cell anemia, and there you see how much more energy a person needs to re refurbish, to reinvent erythrocytes. A sickle cell anemic person needs 1,500 kilojoule, and you know about, about what this number means now, per day more for building erythrocytes. So the erythropoietic process is a very energy demanding process. Costs. It costs extremely. And the second thing with anemia and with the lower levels of hemoglobin and the lower levels of iron and the lower levels of myoglobin, you you clearly have less activity. If you are anemic, you go to bed and you say, don't want to have something to do with this active life. You go and stop this. And this is a very rapid response. And taking away the iron from the system is important because the bacteria use iron. We use iron because in the uh, oxidative phosphorylation in the mitochondrium, we use the iron. The iron is the important uh, um, um, ion in the oxidative phosphorylation process to build ATP in the mitochondrium. So we take the iron and the bacterium does the same. So if you reduce the number of circulating iron with an anemic process, you don't give it to the bacterium and you, you keep it for yourself. And you reduce the amount of energy needed for the erythropo pro, uh, erythropoiesis process. And you have general osteoporosis and local bone erosions. You need the calcium and phosphate. I mentioned this already. So I hope that I was able to convince you that the systemic response now is a part of the entire thing. And if the systemic response is needed too long for a too long time as a neuroendocrine support of the wo immune and wound response, then it has desolate consequences for the, for the people because the people all get these problems, and these problems belong to the disease. And nowadays, when we have these nice therapies with methotrexate, with anti-TNF therapy, with anti-IL-6 therapy, with anti-T-cell therapy, anti-B-cell therapy, those patients do not die of the acute problem of inflammation. They die because of a higher mortality, of cardiovascular mortality, arteriosclerotic mortality. This is clearly higher in these patients. So it's nicely studied now. So they have a systemic pro uh, problem and not so much a local problem anymore. But the low smoldering, very little inflammation that is little higher than normal is already enough to activate all the systems. So now, I, this is a, a, a certain theoretical aspect, but there's another application of the theory using the aspects of energy regulation and evolutionary medicine. And that is the time point, a time point of the chronification. When does a disease become chronic? Uh, we always ask this, when, when is it? And from these energy things, you can deduce an interesting time point. And I show you this time point in, in, in the next few slides and then I finish. These are our uh, ancestors, you recognize them by name. Here yeah, you see them. Now we are here. You see here the date range. This is a million years. Yeah. This is the body mass of these people. This has been well studied. And when you use a sickness related metabolic rate that is mentioned here, the sickness re related metabolic rate is given as the basal metabolic rate multiplied by the factor of 1.5. The 1.5 is a very good number because um, Frank Butgereit in, in immune cells showed if you activate immune cells, they rise the energy, energy expenditure by the factor of 1.5. So I use the 1.5 as, uh, as a good measure here. So the sickness-related metabolic rate is this here. You see, the Australopithecus had a lower afferensis, had a lower sickness-related metabolic rate because he has a lower metabolic rate per se. He was smaller. A little smaller, so he was not so has not a big metabolic rate as compared to to today in the United States. Is the the mean value of 74 kilograms? The metabolic rate is of course higher. So the stored energy can be calculated from fat tissue, from protein, from protein. You can forget the glucose because the glucose is very little, and you can calculate the stored energy from the body uh, mass uh, and from um, the height. 
And there are formulas in the literature, beautiful formulas. You can take these formulas together, and then you can calculate the stored energy for Australopithecus afarensis. And when you use the stored energy and divide the stored energy by the sickness-related metabolic rate, because you don't take up much energy, you confine yourself to a local place, you don't eat. You use your stores. So take the sickness-related metabolic rate and divide it or the other way around, take the stored energy and divide it, and then you see the total consumption time. If you don't eat, you have a strong disease, then the Australopithecus afarensis was dead within 19.2 days. He used all his stored energy. And in the clinic, when you are in the clinic, you often see this, that a patient who dies, or shortly before dying, I had this all in my family, I know how this looks like, and probably one or the other has seen a similar picture. They use all their energy, and they don't take up energy. My father had a B-cell lymphoma in his last half year with huge inflammation. He didn't eat. Didn't eat. But you cannot eat half a year. You cannot stop eating for half a year. And he was a strong man. He was like, like a bull. But he lost all his energy within a half a year and had only very little uptake. And if you calculate the total consumption time, you can see here that the, uh, that the Australopithecus had only 19 days, whereas the Homo sapiens of today has 43 days. And if you are even bigger, you have a little more time. So, total consumption time amounts to 19 to 43 days. Interestingly, the adaptive immune response fits exactly into this time frame. Because the adaptive immune response with an up of clonal expansion, you see here the antigen presentation, then the clonal expansion, the lymphoid organ, the differentiation, the effector phase, and the antigen elimination with humoral immunity starting, cell-mediated immunity starting, has a similar time frame. It fits exactly into this time frame of 19 days, 90 to 43 days. If this would have lasted longer, we wouldn't have probably the energy to do it. So the, the evolutionary process between energy storage and, and immune response are tightly linked. The close co-evolution between bacteria and viruses and the responding system in a coordinated fashion, in a network system, is very well adapted to each other so that the adaptive immunity takes exactly the time that it needs to, sta to start and to stop the disease and go down and be happy again and fine, and that's it. So the total consumption time and the adaptive immune response are similar. Now, this has been positively selected for the acute diseases. And the immune response, because it was co-evolution, stops in a coordinated way after 90 to 43 days. And the coordinated way of stopping is highly important and is not only a question of the immune system, it's also a question of the neuroendocrine support system in this network. So now we can say there are consequences in a chronic inflammatory disease. If a disease is progressive and long-standing, for example in autoimmunity, and therapies are available to stop the lethal emaciation. We do this usually today. We do it because we give immunosuppressive therapy so the patient doesn't lose, lose all his weight. Yeah. Um, so in a, then when we have such a situation, a long-standing progressive immuni autoimmunity, then co it can develop into a chronic phase. For the chronic phase of such immune-mediated disease, the organism would lack positively selected genes, signaling pathways, and networks to be able to stop the chronic in disease in a coordinated fashion. There are no stopping factors. There are no networks that can stop it. Because it's ongoing. It's an autoimmune attack. There is no system conserved for the stop. The framework of evolutionary biology and neuroendocrine immune energy regulation thus defines the point of transition from an acute to a chronic disease as the time point of complete energy consumption, 19 to 43 days. Okay, this was it.
it, it has theoretical aspects, it has hypothetical aspects, but I think, and I, I reported this several times now in different locations, the people um, liked it, and uh, I hope you liked it too, and it might explain a lot, and let us see in the future what will happen with it, how important it might be, how it might be accepted, you never know it, you just come up with a theory, with a hypothesis, and then you see how the people respond, and they respond positive or negative. In this case, most often the people respond positive, and I hope you do the same. Thank you for your attention.